Hi, I'm Rosie Acosta. I'm a meditation teacher, speaker, and author of You Are Radically Loved, a healing journey to self-love. Look, I grew up in East Los Angeles during the 92 LA riots, and it set me on a troubled path. I didn't grow up with mentors in my life, so I turned to reading as many books as I possibly could to learn about the purpose of life. In my journey, I found that having these conversations gave me life, and I decided I wanted to create a place where I could share these conversations with my community. So come have a sit with me as we learn about, well, everything. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Radically Loved podcast. This is Tessa. I am so, so, so excited for this conversation today. It's going to be a really good one. So take a seat or go for a walk or go for a long drive. Do whatever you want to do while you're listening to a really meaty, juicy podcast conversation. This is going to be a good one. I can't say that enough. And so um, we have the pleasure today of speaking with Dr. Nejwa Zabian. Um, she just released a audiobook. It's audiobook only, uh, exclusively by Penguin, Penguin Random House, and it's called Conversations on Letting Go, Guidance, Meditations, and Exercises to Help You Live Authentically. Um, and so Dr. Neshwa, I wanted to, we started to talk about this before we hit record, but I wanted to speak to the, the, um, I guess it's the decision around why it is an audiobook only uh, for this particular book. So letting go has been a topic that ever since I started writing and putting my work out there, people ask me about how do I let go of someone I love? How do I let go of a dream I had? How do I let go of the way people think of me? How do I let go in general? And it doesn't matter how often I write about it or, or, you know, in which, in which format, whether it's video, audio, text, there's always engagement. There's always more questions. But I found that it is during times when I'm speaking directly to someone, whether I'm speaking directly to camera or if I'm speaking in an interview and I go really deep into the complexities and hardships of letting go, that is when people are mostly engaged. So I wanted conversations on letting go to be like a conversation you're having with someone that you deeply trust in helping you to let go. And I have the honor and privilege of having that trust of my audience. And so I wanted it to be like you're sitting in a room having tea or coffee with me and we are having a conversation on letting go of either infidelity, toxic relationships, internal and external perceptions and injustices that you go through in your life. I wanted it to be more like you are actually engaged in having a conversation with me because as I was addressing the questions that by the way it is my audience who posed those questions like I I handpicked the questions that I answered in this audiobook so as I'm answering each question I'm thinking based on my experience with people struggling with letting go and with the kinds of questions that come up for them I'm thinking of those questions and answering as I go along so for the person listening, they are going to feel like as they're listening, if a question pops up in their mind, but how do I do this? Or but how do I get around this part of letting go of someone who's toxic or that I am actively listening to them and answering those questions? So that's very difficult to do in written format um, because I can't talk the way I'm talking right now. There's that whole editing process where certain things have to be said a certain way and periods have to go in certain places and commas have to go in certain places. But if I'm having a conversation with you like this, it's closer to your heart because it's conversational. So and and I also believe that um, I was way more authentic during this book, the recording of this book, than I ever was in my other writings because a big part of this book was unscripted. 
Yes, I sat down and I wrote, which meditations do I want to include? Which affirmations do I want to include? Which practical exercises do I want to include? What parts about letting go of this particular particular topic do I want to make sure I hit on? I absolutely planned that out. But as I was in the studio, I was talking as if someone just came up to me right now, asked me that question, and I'm answering. So my emotions are usually very close to the surface. But in this case, they were close to the surface and they came out. And I just know that anyone listening is going to feel how much of myself I put into it. So they're going to feel even closer and closer to me. So there were a lot of benefits to this only being an audiobook. And so far, the reception has been great. So I just know it's only going to reach more and more people. Yeah, I I can I can resonate with that so much, um, having the pleasure of listening to it myself. And I really enjoy the the format of the crowdsourcing the questions. And I also really enjoy hearing someone else's voice asking those questions and then hearing your voice answer the question. And even if like there, there, you give several um, examples of questions around, let's say infidelity, infidelity, for example, even if we are the ones who transgressed or we are the ones who were transgressed upon, it's like you really do hit all the points or all the questions. I mean, it's true what you said. (laughs) Oftentimes I'd be listening. I'd be like, well, what about this? Well, what about that? And then you would answer it and I'd be like, oh, <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> yes. um, so I love that. I love that format. I was curious, how did you come up with the idea for this, this style of book? Because you're, you're a multi-time author and I, I heard you say that you're writing your next book. I don't know if you can even speak to that, but this is a departure, right? From our typical format. What inspired you to, to I guess... I wouldn't, I don't even know if I would say write it this way, but create it this way. Well, I think where it began was um, with Welcome Home. So Welcome Home is my fourth book and it came out a couple of years ago. It's been hugely successful. It continues to, I mean, I get hundreds of messages to this day, just from people saying, thank you for writing this. It made such a big difference in my life. Welcome Home was a big departure from the shorter style of writing that I first began with uh, years ago. And it was in longer format and you could feel like I'm speaking to you as you were reading it. And we noticed that it was more than a third of the sales that were in audio which I'm not talking about sales right now. I'm just saying that's incredible to get more than a third of your sales in audio. That tells me that people enjoy listening to me. Um, And I didn't know this, but most books don't get that kind of big portion of audio downloads. So that to me was a sign, a message from the people who enjoy my writings that they actually want more of this one-on-one feel where they're listening to me. So that's that's where it began. And letting go, like I said, has always been a topic that people always, always, always ask me about. There is not a day that goes by that I don't get a question about letting go. I even had an entire course on it. I've addressed it in interviews and in Welcome Home and in my poetry from the past. And it's still one of the most popular topics I get asked about. And I wanted to create something that specifically, you know, discussed just letting go, not letting go in a book where I'm talking about how to build a home within yourself, not letting go in a book where I'm just addressing heartbreak, letting go in general of anything in life, whether it's a person or a thing or a job. So ultimately, letting go, in my view, isn't about focusing on what it is or who it is that you are letting go of. Letting go is ultimately about holding on to yourself. If you can reframe letting go from being this painful thing where you're only focusing on how will I let go of this person or that thing, say, how important is it for me to live an authentic life? How important is it for me to be 
together with myself, to not feel like a part of me is being pulled in that direction or that direction, to feel like I'm bonded to something or someone outside of me that doesn't welcome me, that doesn't love me, that doesn't respect me, that doesn't make me feel fulfilled. How is it that I hold on to myself? So if there's one thing I want you to take from this audiobook, it's letting go is about holding on to yourself and leaving behind anything or anyone that makes your journey to yourself harder and that makes you have to run away from yourself. So I wanted to have that in one place and not just a section in a book where I'm discussing something else. I just I just wanted this to be about letting go. I wanted it to have the practical exercises that you needed. I wanted it to have the affirmations you needed, the guided meditations you needed. I wanted it to have the validation you need that the struggle you're having with letting go of like I said, a person or a thing, an injustice that you went through, a toxic family relationship. I, I wanted that validation of how difficult it is to try to let go. I wanted all of that to be in one place so that you don't feel like you have to go to different places to search for it. This is a holistic approach to letting go. And I just think that any person who listens to it is just going to walk away feeling like they have that push to free themselves from anything that's anchoring them in the wrong place. Mm, yeah, I appreciate that. So you speak to this, and I believe you do speak to this in the beginning of the book. And and forgive me if I'm asking you a question that I feel like I should already know the answer to because you did answer it in the book. <laughs> but, <laughs> It's so, this book, I think for me, at least, this is a little side note. It's one that I'll definitely have to go back to and refer back to because these are lessons that, you know, I've spent 40 years kind of ingraining and teaching myself. And now the idea of letting go, the idea of embracing myself and coming home to myself is going to take me a long time, right? It's going to take me some practice. It's going to take me some, what was it that Dr. Nishwa said about that? Because... I know there's some sort of um, kind of almost like a formula to it, but I can't remember exactly where to start with it. And so where I'm going with this question is, let's let's use the example of toxic relationships. Okay, say we have to let go of a toxic relationship. I think the thing that I personally struggle with, and I know when I talk to my circle of friends, um, people that are close to me too, that may identify as fellow empaths is... How do I let go if I feel like I have some fault or I need to acknowledge or I need to respond to the situation that I've cre co-created with this person? Mm -hmm. um, is that making sense? Yes. But I remember the part you're talking about where I said something like, if you spent whatever your age is now, so I'm 33, if I spent 33 years of my life falling into people pleasing tendencies, if people pleasing was my go to strategy, to stay safe, and to feel like I have done everything that I can do to make a relationship work, not just a romantic one, but any kind of relationship, or, or to have that inner fulfillment that I've done what I can do, then it's going to take time for me to learn that I am not what I do. I am who I am. Because for people pleasers, we think that the more we do, the more that's going to increase our value in other people's eyes, which ultimately somehow increases our value in our own eyes, because we think the validation we get from others makes us you know, it makes us feel better about ourselves because that's the source that we have been going to for val validation our entire lives. So I say, once you become aware that you are not what you do, but you are who you are, that awareness enough, it, that awareness on its own is not enough because you've spent, your body has spent X number of years, decades, I don't know how long, thinking that that past way of being and thinking and perceiving yourself is the right way. So as you're moving in an opposite direction where you're like, no, actually, I am enough on my own. I don't need to do more to prove to you that I deserve more from you. 
I, on my own, you know, when people ask you, like, what do you bring to the table? Yeah. Sometimes you hear people say, like, I am the whole goddamn table. (laughs) Or (laughs) what do you mean? What do I bring to the table? I bring myself to the table. And that's enough. And so, and I'm not talking about like, because I know some people might be listening to this thinking, well, you do have to put in effort. You do have to, yes, absolutely. But there's a difference between someone treating you badly as a human. They're not treating you with the respect that you deserve. They're making you feel like you're less than as you are. And someone saying, you know, making you feel valued and loved and respected and saying, I would appreciate if you would do this, or this is how, you know, you can help me fulfill one of my needs. There's a difference between that kind of relationship you have with someone where you are actively trying to prove yourself to them and your worth to them versus being in a relationship with someone who already knows your worth and treats you as such and speaks to you respectfully about the things that they believe you should be doing or that you can be doing to make the relationship better. So I hope that answers your question. I think that's what you were referring to. So the the end, uh, the, I guess the, the big message I would like anyone to take from this um, topic in particular is on your journey to get to a place where you no longer fall into those past patterns that t- for some period of your life helped you survive. So on your journey of of getting from that place to the new place where you stand in your truth, you are your authentic self, you don't betray yourself, you don't run away from yourself to feel safe in someone else's arms, you don't betray yourself, you don't abandon yourself to get from that past place to this new place that you are headed. Give yourself the compassion that you need. Give yourself the lack of judgment that you need because ultimately you might hear voices in your head that say well you know better so why can't you do better well again in in that in a moment like that it's time for you to step in and say well of course i'm not going to know by what i do because what i've known for so long goes against what i know now so it's going to take time for me to make this change. So give yourself that compassion. Be that best friend for yourself as you're going through this transition. Because what when you fuel your change with shame, the only way that it can continue is through shaming yourself. And you don't want to do that anymore. Now that you recognize that you want to live an authentic life, that's the end goal of letting go. Now that you realize that, you realize that you no longer have to speak to yourself in the voices that you heard when you were younger or even up to this point in your life. We don't welcome shame anymore. We speak to ourselves with compassion. Yeah, thank you. So this, for me, this kind of snowballs, I guess I would say. (laughs) Um, into the realm of, okay, so I, let's say I'm recognizing I'm, I have some toxic relationships to let go of and I'm practicing standing in my authentic truth and I'm ready to take that step to let go of that toxic relationship. And then I do. And what happens next typically for me is, okay, then I have to be with myself and mm-hmm. then all of my old habits and behaviors, no, which you're, you're speaking to this exactly, don't work for me anymore. And those habits and behaviors um, distracted me from being lonely. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to, or whatever the emotion is, but I think loneliness is really underneath a lot of it, a lot of that behavior. Yes. Uh, and so what do we, how do we sit with our loneliness? How do we, how do we, invite the loneliness in what is the purpose of the loneliness do we need to feel it you absolutely need to feel it i mean to get through it you need to welcome it so i'll i'll make a connection to welcome home which i did reference multiple times in conversations on letting go when pain of any kind knocks on your door let it in you know 
it's there. It's not like it's going to go away by you ignoring it or avoiding it or distracting yourself from it by talking to someone or going out with someone. It's still there waiting to be felt because that's going to give you the answer to why it is that you are struggling with letting it in. Because usually we push away what we know is going to open our eyes in some way and it might push us to make a decision that really scares us, right? That loneliness might be scary to you because you know that the reason you're feeling lonely is that your entire life you've been surrounding yourself with people who don't see you for who you are. So you've internalized the belief that you don't deserve to be seen as you are. So when you're alone and lonely, you are with that thought or belief on your own. And it feels so heavy because you've never confronted it. You've never looked at it and said, it really hurts to think you or to feel you or to believe you about myself. But so like imagine turning that emotion or that feeling or that belief into something or someone that you're speaking to. Then you give it an opportunity to also tell you where it's coming from. Because a lot of the times, the hardest emotions we go through protect us from something. So that loneliness might be trying to protect us from, you know, our fear that, so so the loneliness that gets to a point where you're like, you know, I can't deal with this anymore. I'm going to go hang out with people. So that loneliness might be serving the purpose of, For example, protecting you from being alone or feeling or thinking to yourself, I deserve to be alone. So it might be serving that kind of purpose for you. Like it's that painful because at the end of the day, you internally do believe that you don't deserve to be around people. So then that loneliness is like pushing you to be with people so that you don't believe that belief about yourself. But if you sit with it and you hear it out and that's what it tells you, because I've done this before and I know it sounds weird, but I've spoken to my emotions before and given them an opportunity to tell me what's going on. So when that loneliness, for example, told me, well, the reason that I push you so much is because I know that you believe that you don't deserve to belong. And so I'll push you so hard so that you go and interact with people, even though I know those people aren't the best for you, just so that you don't spend more time in that belief that you don't deserve to be welcomed or that you don't deserve to belong. And so then I can speak back to that loneliness and say, but isn't it better if we just change that belief altogether? And so now all of a sudden, instead of me pushing the loneliness away, I'm giving it a voice, I'm listening to it. And now I'm feeling like that loneliness is actually part of me. It's a natural part of me. And I welcome it. I don't make a part of myself feel like I'm abandoning it. So yeah, that's, that's how I go about it. So the way that you would deal with it is give it a voice, listen to it and tell it to trust you. Like maybe in the past, you weren't the most trustworthy person to yourself because you didn't keep promises to yourself. Maybe you would promise yourself that You will no longer accept people treating you a certain way, but then you would allow them to treat you a certain way. So you've proved to yourself and to that loneliness that you are not a trustworthy person. So you can speak to that loneliness and say, I know you're trying to protect me by pushing me this hard so that I could break out of you and go hang out with other people. But let's work on actually breaking that belief altogether from its core and we will be able to get through difficult times where it's just me and you and we're going to be lonely, but we will get to a point where we will learn to surround ourselves with people who see us for who we are and who actually make us feel like we belong. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. (laughs) So I, uh, as I was getting ready for this interview this morning, I had, uh, I received a text message from someone who is very, very dear to me, who I have watched go through 
the same kind of relationship archetype over and over again. I've, I've watched this person choose. It's kind of like this caricature of a person who checks these literal boxes. And it's like, to me, it looks like they are choosing the same person again and again and again. <laughs> and, and it's heartbreaking to watch that. Um, and I get questions from this person, like, I need advice on this. What would, what would you do? And uh, what are your thoughts on this situation? And of course, my knee-jerk reaction is to be like, um, you know, you're so much more valuable. You don't need this person. You, uh, you've got to break free of this, you know, all the things like, okay, I just need to give you Dr. Nejwa's book and you need to listen to it. <laughs> Do it now. <laughs> yes. um, and I can't obviously force this person to do anything that they're not ready to do. Right. Mm -hmm when they're ready to to make the change and to pivot and choose someone or choose themselves over someone else, then I mm -hmm. guess they'll do it. Right. Yes. What do we do with, with, you know, as a, and now I'm, I'm outing myself as an empath. You called, you called me out on that before yes. I started to record, but <laughs> I want to be a good friend and I want to be honest and I want to be helpful. Uh, and I guess what I've learned over the course of the years in my relationship with this person is that it doesn't, it never helps for me to be like, stop doing that. You know, you shouldn't be choosing this person. You should do this. You should do that because they're going to make their own decisions anyways. So yes. do you have any advice for people in our lives that we love and who we, we want to help? How do we help these people? Can we, or do the, we have to let them? Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yes. No. Um, the first thing I would say is when someone is in a bad situation, they know they're in a bad situation. They are already judging themselves. They are, are, all, are already telling themselves, you know better. You deserve better. You're value. Like they know all the things that you are telling them, but they are feeling stuck for a reason. There is a reason that friend of yours keeps falling into the same kind of relationship. Maybe she's not taking the time to learn about why it is that those relationships feel like the safest to her. Mm -hmm. When we feel that safety, I always talk about the difference between safety that is because of familiarity and safety that's actual you know, welcoming of your authentic self where you're welcome to be yourself and speak your mind and your heart and not feel like you're judged or not feel like love is going to be taken away from you if you express yourself as you are. There's a safety where it's like you are protecting yourself and there's a safety where you can expand and fully be yourself. So there's a reason why your friend keeps falling into relationships where the safety she feels is more that protective safety where as long as I stay a certain way, I will be fine in this environment. And it most likely stems from her childhood experiences or past relationship experiences. And the answer to this is to figure out why it is that she feels stuck. So what I would say if a friend of mine came to me with this same issue, like I always fall for the same type of person. Why is it? What am I going to do when he's doing this or she's doing this, whatever, you know, it is that they're going through. I just say, wow, it, it really feels like you're in an awful place. Like you feel stuck. Like I, I get that the difference between what you know you should do and what you are doing. Like you probably feel like there's a big gap between those two. Like just give that validation. And then you'll hear them start kind of unwinding and you'll start feeling like that unstuckness is coming in because now they realize that there is a deeper issue that needs to be addressed and also that they have the power to address it um, by not just looking at this relationship right now in isolation from all the past experiences that led to it, but by looking at all the past experiences and patterns that led to it. So if that friend spent her entire life 
around people who put her down, spoke to her a certain way, berated her, disrespected her, abused her. If she meets someone new who does exactly the same thing, her body thinks, well, we got through it so many times before, we can do it again. Whereas somebody who didn't have that experience in the past, who's always had experiences where they were loved and treated with respect and kindness and seen for who they are. If they meet someone who treats them with abuse and disrespect and unkindness and all of that and conditional love, that to them will be a hard red line. Like, no, I don't deserve this because to them, this is not familiar at all. This feels very unsafe. Whereas to your friend, it's safe. Yes, it's a protective kind of safety, but but I know I've survived it before. So I know I can survive it again. So she will put up with things that another person wouldn't put up with. So for her to understand where that patterning comes from, is there a belief that she has that if she tries hard enough, that person will see her for who she is and will treat her appropriately? Is there an inner belief that says, for example, um, you know, just all relationships have tough times. And if you wait long enough, that person will see. And if you wait long enough and try hard enough and show this person that you will love them through the dark times and whatever, they are going to turn to you at some point and say, thank you for everything you've done. She will know what that belief is if she has that conversation with someone. And she will understand at a cellular level, not just at a logical level, she will go into her body, she will understand what changes need to be made. So you probably notice in conversations on letting go, I do prompt the person listening to tune into their body quite a bit. And I've talked about times when I've tuned into my body and in thinking of certain experiences I went through, I would Um, you know, and how they felt in my body, I would like get into the fetal position and my hands would go into fists and I'm really trying to protect myself. And so in times like that, I'm not staying at the logical level, not staying at what my mind knows logically, what I've read in books. Now I'm going into my body and asking it like, and right now, as I'm saying this to you, I'm feeling things in my body because the moment you tune in, do I feel tension somewhere? How did I feel in that moment when someone cheated on me? How did I feel in that moment when someone disrespected me? A lot of the times when things like that happen, because of how heavy the emotions feel at the time, we don't feel them. Our body just either goes numb. It goes into one of the you know, responses, fight, flight, fawn, or freeze, or whatever the response that your body goes through. For me, it's I, I freeze. So I don't process things immediately. So when I give myself permission to go back to, let's say, a moment when somebody disrespected me and ask myself, how did this actually feel? I start feeling sensations that where my body is when, for example, I've thought back to an experience when somebody disrespected me in a moment like that my body just goes into freeze. I don't process it many times. You know, when people tell you like, don't take this personally, it's not about you. I'm likely to say that to myself, like, whoa, that has nothing to do with me. Why would somebody do that or say that? But it is hurtful for someone to be disrespectful. So in the moment, I will not feel it. And then a few hours later or a few days later, if I tell myself, like, how did that actually feel? I've had so many moments where my body will literally go into the fetal position and my knees come up to my chest and I just, I feel small and I want to hide. And so when I do that, I'm actually telling my body, your feelings matter. What you went through matters. That was hurtful. That's not nice. You don't deserve that. So now I'm becoming for myself what I wish I had in a moment when that happened. And the more and more I do that, the more my body trusts that I actually will be present when those things happen and that I will make the right decisions for myself as a result. That's why it's scary for people to tune into their bodies. That's why it's scary for people to sit with those hard emotions because 
when once you sit with them and they actually give you signals for what true safety looks like, that kind of safety where you can expand, not the one where you're constantly protecting yourself, the kind of safety where you can be fully present as you are. When you listen to them and allow them to give you those signals, I'm getting goosebumps as I'm talking about this, it will push you to make decisions to let go of people who are not good for you, to walk away from environments that are toxic to your well-being, to walk away from a job that isn't feeding your soul or maybe where you're being bullied, to walk away from friendships that don't serve you anymore, that actually don't see you, that don't love you as you are. That's why it's scary because once we listen to our body and we listen to what everything that's going through it is telling us, we are prompted to make a change. And making that change, knowing the consequences that come with it, is scary because it's going to force us to let go of people we never thought we could live without and let go of a job we thought that is, you know, the ultimate dream job that I want or I need this so much. It forces us to just cut that cord and say, I'm done. That's scary because now you're feeling like you're unanchored in some way. Like, like it's like it's like you're walking on a certain surface and you're holding on to something as you're walking because you're so scared of falling. And then all of a sudden you're not holding on to that anymore. And you have to trust in your own ability to walk. That's hard. You're going to feel a bit wobbly and scared for a while, but then you realize how much better and easier your life is when you're walking on your own and not with that thing that was either weighing you down or dictating what speed you walk at. Yeah, I so resonate with that sensation that being unanchored for me, it feels kind of floaty and light, yeah. which is yeah. so scary. You're right. It's so scary. It's scary for me to trust that is a good thing because it's unfamiliar. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I always, I always think about, you know, the axioms people will say, okay, well, you left this toxic job. You left this toxic relationship. You need to give yourself time to heal. You need to give yourself time to learn your lessons. Um, And, you know, people will typically throw out some sort of like number of days or years where you should really be with yourself to make sure that you've learned your lesson so that you don't repeat it again. Um, And I'm wondering what you think about that idea of like, oh, give yourself six months between relationships. So give yourself uh, uh, some time between this job and finding the next job. Is it, can we get that prescriptive about it or is it really more? No, I don't think, I don't think you can get that prescriptive about it because the person going through it is the only one who knows what they need. Some people might need a year after a relationship. Some people might need five years after a relationship because When you're letting go of, let's say, a toxic relationship, you're not just letting go of that relationship itself. You are letting go of beliefs you lived with for X number of years. You're letting go of certain ways of living and behaving and routines and whatever that you lived with for X number of years. So you are the only one who knows how much time you need. And when you put pressure, this is what I learned from my own experiences, when you put pressure on yourself to reach a certain deadline with your healing, you're actually pushing the healing away because it, it's it's kind of like constricting this thing that's trying to float in the air. Again, so you're anchoring it to something else saying, unless you happen by this time, Something is wrong with you. And so I've met people who've gotten out of toxic relationships. Like I had this one friend who was in a relationship for about six years. She was engaged to the guy. They were about to get married. And she broke off the engagement a couple of weeks before the wedding. And she was very, very depressed for a couple of months. And in the middle of her depression, she met someone at another friend's house and now they're married and they have a kid and she looks back and she says, that didn't stand in the way of my healing. If anything, it helped me. 
Mm-hmm. And so she trusted herself and she's in a very healthy relationship. Like she, she did so much work while she was in that past relationship to realize what she deserved and didn't deserve that she was ready in what many people would consider the, is a very short period of time, but that's how her timeline was. And she didn't have a goal in her mind for when she wanted to meet someone. She just did. And it happened to be the right person for her. So I would say, don't put timelines on your healing. Don't don't sit there and listen to someone who tells you, you know, 21 days. I hear that a lot. It takes 21 days to break a habit. And it takes, no, think of what kind of life you want to live. And think of what kind of person you want to be based on who you authentically are. And again, you discover that by tuning in, by listening to what your heart tells you and by believing your intentions without any outside influence that tells you, well, you're doing this or you're living this way because you're trying to project a certain image. Like when you cancel out all the noise that's outside of you and you become your own biggest believer in yourself when you listen to all of that and choose this is the kind of life I want to live based on who I authentically am then the whole life that's coming ahead becomes part of your healing timeline and whatever happens along that timeline happens you can meet someone In 10 days, you can meet someone in 10 years. As long as you've made the choice that you are living an authentic life, that means you are trusting yourself as you're going along this journey. And this time when you meet someone who shows the slightest bit of a red flag that they are disrespectful or they don't see you for who you are or they are someone that you can't trust or they've it could be the littlest thing when you listen to your intuition and listen to what your body's telling you. And again, I've said this in conversations on letting go. Your body has lived with you since the moment you were born. That's why sometimes when you meet some people, you will feel uneasy and you don't have to find a logical reason for why you need to limit your contact with somebody who makes you feel that way. Because your body is sending you a signal, this person isn't right for you. Because your body knows, your body has been in situations where a person who emits that kind of energy was dangerous to it. So as long as you make the decision to trust what your body tells you without sitting there and trying to be like, well, maybe this person is different, maybe this, maybe that. Tell your body, I trust you as I go along and I will listen to you. That's it. And then your trust will grow over time and a timeline will just not exist. Mm -hmm. I love that so much. (laughs) So Dr. Nejwa, where can people go to connect with you and get this book and, and stay connected and, you know, follow along with your journey? Well, you can find me on basically every social media platform and um, like Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook. It's all the same username, Nejwa Zabian, um, N-A-J-W-A-Z-E-B-I-A-N. And conversations on letting go, I found like I had to do this because (laughs) it's an audio book, so I don't have it in a physical, but this is what the cover looks like. You can find it um, on any audio platform that you listen on. If you go to the link in my bio on any social media platform, you'll find it. And again, I know that when you look at it, you'll say, I want it in my hands. I know that. But trust me, when you start listening to it, you will realize that this was the best way that you could receive it. It's directly from my heart to yours. And I just know that it's going to make a huge difference for you. Mm. That's so beautiful. It's true. I can vouch for that. I absolutely can. <laughs> Thank That's you. Good. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today. And I'm just, I'm so glad that you're doing this work and it's out in the world. And we we really Thank appreciate you. you sharing it with us. Thank you. And I really appreciate that you invited me. And I, you know, I, I hope that we can stay connected and continue to spread this this work in the world because I honestly think that. The more and more people around the world who make the decision to just be themselves freely and unconditionally and not work so hard to prove anything to anyone but themselves, 
the more healed our world will be in every aspect, not just in the, in the, you know, domain of healing and letting go and self-help. I think our entire world has the ability to heal. So I also thank you for the work that you do. Oh, thank you. I love that's a great note to end on. I love that so much. <laughs> what a beautiful call to action. So yeah, let's go, let's go learn how to trust ourselves, be with our authentic selves, trust our authentic selves and commit to it. I think that's such a beautiful call to action. Thank you so much for listening to the Radically Loved Podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Facebook at Radically Loved Rosie, on Instagram at Rosie Acosta, and Twitter at Rosie Acosta. By the way, this is original music by DJ Taz Rashid. You can follow DJ Taz on Spotify and check out the best music for yoga and meditation. This has been a Mod Pod Studio production. Check them out at www.modpodstudio.com.